right on. Go ahead and have a seat and meet me in the good old book of Hosea. And I'm, you know, last week was an anomaly. It was an oddity. It was a rarity. Not only did we get through a chapter, we got through two chapters. And um, it made me a little greedy. And I was thinking, I think we can do this again. Yeah. John's eyes just about bugged out of his head. So, yeah, so we'll see. We may, you know, I may get through it and be like, all right, verse 1. And then it's 7.30, and I'm thinking, yeah, we're not going to get through it. So we'll see, you know, if, if not. The only thing I have on my dance card is the rapture. And uh, so if, if we end the book in Hosea, we got, we got nothing but. And then we'll get to learn it, you know, hands on. Get to talk to Hosea and see what he had to think about it. So Hosea chapter five and it uh one one commentator that i listened to and read his stuff he divided the book into two sections and he says chapters one through three are about the troubles in hosea's home life with the wife that is not too faithful and the kids that are not his and then he says the remainder of the book is about hosea's troubled homeland because the whole picture about him and his wife and him and his family, it was meant to show the people of Israel that's, that's how you're treating God. God is not stupid. God is not a chump. He knows how people feel about him. You know, he know, and a lot of times, and he's, we're going to get into it tonight, but, you know, we draw near to God with our lips, but in our hearts we're far from him. God is not a chump. God knows that. We're not, we're fooling people, but we're not fooling the Lord. And that was something he was trying to communicate to Israel through Hosea. It's something that he still has to communicate to us, to the church, because we love the Lord. We're going to heaven. But sometimes the Lord, he gets, he gets nudged down from, from number one because I want to be number one because you want to be number one. And we need that reminder. Yeah, I mean, Hosea is not one of those inspirational books. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard, you know, the guy on the radio, we're going through the book of Hosea. Click, no thank you. Uh, it's unpleasant, but boy, it sure does get one's attention. So the rest of this is, it's an indictment. It's a bunch of charges. This is what you've done, Israel. This is how you treat me. And uh, this is how I feel about it. And by the way, just like I said last week, uh, if this if you could envision Israel as a person sitting down and reading this, America sh could sure be standing up reading over the shoulder because a lot of the stuff that we could see that the, the Lord was saying to them, uh, oh my goodness, if we're not, I mean, he, I don't think he's whispering it anymore. I think he's got the megaphone out and people are still saying, huh? And so, and I think Hosea knew because look what he says. He says, hear this, O priests, Take heed, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king. For yours is the judgment, because you have been a snare to Mitzvah and a net spread on Tabor. And so he starts off, hey, you, you're not listening, so I'm going to remind you, listen up. I want you to hear it. And look at the group that he talks to. He says, he says hear this, priests. What did Peter say? He says that judgment begins with the house of the Lord. Yeah, okay, America's a mess. Okay, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm just, I'm conceding defeat right now. May the spirit be running wild November 5th. Just concede at 8 o'clock, whoever. Because um, I don't think we're going to get through <laughs> two chapters. But I think everybody would agree our country is an absolute mess. And that's, that's the way it is because America is full of humans. And you could say, America, wake up. America, get with this. America, get with that. But think about this. What if every single church in our county, every single church in this region, every single uh, church in the state, and of course, because I'm greedy, I'm not going to stop, every single church in our country, whether it's the mega church or the home Bible study or just the little itty-bitty country church that's just trying to keep the lights on. If every, everyone said, this is what we're going to be all about. We're going to be about preaching the word of the Lord. And I'm not even saying that they have to do it the Calvary way. They don't even have to do the expositional teaching. 
If they just want, if they want to do topicals, if they want to hop and skip, do this book, do the New Testament. But if the heart of every preacher said, I am going to speak the word of the Lord. I am going to communicate God's heart to the people. And if people leave, bye. And if people come, great, come on in. And if there's success, don't care. If there's failure, don't care. But my job as a pastor, our job as a church, is to publish the word of the Lord, to let everybody know. It's not to get big. It's not to be popular. It's not to end up on the TV. It is to communicate to mankind God's heart. Now, what would our country be like if every single church did that? If every church, if, if there would not be all this hopping and skipping and church shopping stuff because, you know, Jay would tick you off in the morning. I'm done with Jay. You come here, I tick you off at night. I'm going to Thursday. I'm the Thursday morning guy. I tick you off then too. Well, I'm going to the night then. Jim and Nate tick you off there. Well, we're, just, we're going to another church. So you go to another church. And that, this guy's preaching the same gospel as those other, tur other turkeys were. We can't get away from it. Repent and love God. Put Jesus first. We can't get away from it. And he says, first of all, the people that need to hear this are the priests. To put God first. To get down to business. We don't have time. We don't have the luxury of being silly. And I could say, come on, Kamala, and get with it, Don, and give me a break, Gavin, and all. And you know what? My name is Jeremy Grant, and I'm not running for governor, and I'm not running for president. I'm, I'm, I'm like Goliath. I'm too big for them to miss. They would have been, uh, took me out. But my job is to preach. Our job is to let people know about Jesus Christ. So the first people on this, on this hit parade are the priests. Hey, you need, you need the, the one, the only time I taught at a pastor's conference was over in the Philippines. And I taught through the book of Jonah. And those guys came up to me and they're, you know, I'm not going to imitate them because I don't know, maybe I'll regret it with YouTube. But anyway, they were mocking me because they was like, Pastor Jeremy, I'm just going to remind you, do your job. Because that was my big thing. Hey, pastors, do your job. Do your job. And if you don't want to do your job, get another job. But do your job. And what's your job? preaching and teaching and, you know, whether it's across a table from a person, from a stool or from a pulpit, do your job. It's your job to preach. And for us Christians, hey, do your job. It ain't our job to be popular. It's not our job to be relevant. It's not our job to be relatable. It's our job to let people know this is the heart of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord for you, for me, for us. So, man, not even through verse 1. Then he says, take heed, O house of Israel, Israel nation, group, folks, everyday folks, Hey, you hear it too. Well, lastly, give ear, O house of the king. It's something funny, and I think apparently it's just always been the way, uh, the way a heart of man has been. Because people, if they're connected, if they're elevated, if they're a governor or a governor's nephew or a congresswoman's nephew or whatever, they figure, ain't going to happen to me. I, I'm untouchable. The, you know, the, the God that these people revere can't touch me. Uh, reaping and, and sowing and reaping and all this stuff ain't going to happen to me. Let, let the populace run crazy. Let them do the smash of grabs. Ain't going to touch me. And here the Lord says, I got news for you. My word, the wake up call, it's for everybody. It's for the church. It's for the common man. It's for the honchos, the big muckety mucks, as I would call them. It's for everybody. And he says, for yours is the judgment because you have been a snare to Mitzpah and a net spread on Tabor. These were two mountains up in northern Israel. One is in the border because Mitzpah is kind of a, um, it's on the mountain range with, with Mount Hermon. And Tabor is in the Galilee region. But they're two high spots. And it's where they would spread their nets they would catch birds. They, would, uh, they were uh, bird fowlers. And so he's, he says, hey, you've been a snare to Mitzvah. You've been a net spread on, on Tabor. It's a play on words to them. He says, basically, because these were also, they would become sinners of idolatry. And he says, you know, you've been, you're known for spreading out your net to catch birds, but you've been catching men. So, you know, 
and you think about our country, you think about all the snares, all the vices that are legal, that are encouraged, and they are meant to ensnare men. It's kind of like if, if we were to say, hey, <laughs> don't gamble, Las Vegas. Like, that would be a kind of good because they gamble in Las Vegas. Or, okay, I was going to make a San Francisco joke, but I'm going to let that one go by. I'm going to leave it unsaid. Use your imaginations. But basically, he's using a play on words saying, uh, you know, you should have been different, but you weren't. He says, now, the revolters are deeply involved in slaughter, though I rebuke them all. Now, you look at that and you, you know, uh, a lot of different commentators, and they were talking about different things that the priests were doing, but he is talking to the priests, and when he calls them revolters, you know, they, these are guys that are always rebelling. These are guys that are going against the system. Who are they rebelling against? They're going against God. Whose system are they going against? They're going against God's system. And they were involved in idolatry. And when it's talking about the slaughter, it's talking about the, the sacrifices that they would offer, not to God, but to other gods. And look at that because the Lord didn't say, oh, you're sacrifice. He says, you're slaughter. He says, it should be a sacrifice. Way back when he implemented the burnt offering, what did the Lord call it? He says, it will be a sweet aroma in my nose. Like when someone barbecues. Now that's, that's a good smell. That makes me happy. But here he says, it's not a sweet smell. You're just killing stuff. You're just slaughtering stuff. And Ezekiel, I made some people mad. It was the death knell of our old church because I was running it. And I, I stand by what I said. But my, the thing I was talking about was, hey, if your heart, if you're just checking a box and coming to church, stay at home. If, you know, you come late, you leave early, you talk to the whole thing, and you just kind of figure, well, I'm good with God because, you know, I came, but I didn't really want to come. Hey, and you think you're doing God or me or us a favor? Stay at home. And I said that. And man, this one lady, she came up to me and she, she got me and she got in on the way out. She got us both. It was two for one special. And, but I quoted from Ezekiel where Ezekiel, speaking for the Lord, he says to the people, he says, you, when you come into my temple, it, it, I don't like it. You, you trample and you're making all this noise. It's not, man, look at all the activity. Look at all the people excited about the Lord. The Lord says, it, it's just noise because God wasn't even a guest in his own house. He, they weren't doing it for the Lord. And he says, if we sing these songs and it's not to the Lord, it's just noise. If I give this message and it's not for the Lord, the Lord's not speaking to me, I'm just giving a lecture. I'm just making noise. I can make noise at home. I, I want to make a joyful noise when I sing here. I want to make noise that makes some sense, makes a difference here. But when we remove God out of the equation, it goes from sacrifice to slaughter. It goes from joyful noise to just racket. And a lot of churches, a lot of Christians need to come back to the why. You know, because people can, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and I'm involved in this. Why? For whom? And if Jesus is not, the, not just the answer, but the real answer, it's time to do some inventory in your hearts. So, he says, though I rebuked them all. I told them that, that they were wrong, but they don't listen. He says, I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you commit harlotry, and Israel is defiled. So it, it goes back and forth when he says Israel and Ephraim. It's just another word for, for Israel. But I, it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, people are like, I mean, people are just little, are little are big children. Because he says, Israel, you're not hidden from me. And, and Ephraim, you commit harlotry. I, I, I know. And it's funny because I, I have a buddy. Like when I say I have a buddy, nine times out of ten, it's the same buddy. I only have one friend. And um, he had a nephew, and his nephew was not too bright. And so his nephew, I think like most kids, he, he believed that when he closed his eyes, he was invisible. You know, because he couldn't see you, he couldn't see us. So he thought, just, I can't see you, you can't see me. So he closed his eyes and he'd make faces at you and rude gestures and all this other stuff. And we just look at him like, I'm like, you're going to do something with your nephew? And he's like, let's just sneak away. And so, and we had fun at his expense. It was a good time. But anyway, that's why you don't leave high schoolers with little kids. It's just not a good idea. But as dumb as that logic is, how many people do you know, Christians included, 
Hey, man, you want to come to church? Oh, no, I, I can't go to church. Oh, I don't believe in God. I, I'm not down with that whole religion thing. And whatever excuse that they give you, because they're living a life, they're doing things that they know are not pleasing. And they think they're hiding it from God. And they think the only way God's ever going to find out is if they come through our doors and the sinometer will go off. And, you know, have you ever heard that? Oh, I can't come to church because the place will collapse on me. But I can go to Lance's Tavern. I can go to the bars. I can, and God is none the wiser because we, we got these trees. We can't get cell service. And God's drones don't work up here. So God doesn't, God doesn't know. So shh, don't tell him. And the same way that these guys really thought that they were hiding something from God and they were wrong, the modern day is like, how about this? God knows. God cares. Get your body up, come to church, get saved, and get right, and quit making a fool of yourself because you're not hiding anything. But it's funny, the, like I kind of mentioned this on Thursday, the further we get from the cross, the worse we get, and we, we, we regress because we we're not getting any better. We're getting worse because we're, the further we get from God and the cross and Jesus, the dumber we get. Well, anyway, it says, verse 4, they do not direct their deeds toward turning to their God. For the spirit of, uh, of harlotry is in their midst. Now that is tough. He says, they, they won't turn their deeds back to me. They won't, these guys, they'll go this way, they'll go that way, they'll go up and under, but they won't, they won't turn to me. They don't want to repent. He says, because their harlotry, their sin, man, it's, it's a part of, of them. They don't want to let it go. They've been doing it for so long, so long they can't imagine what it would be like to quit. And I mean, that's, um, you know, I remember years ago at Good Old Orchard Supply talking with some guy, and he, he was talking about a buddy who had gotten involved in the drugs. And everybody that gets involved with drugs or alcohol or whatever vice it is, the, that first time is just, okay, I want to see if my head's going to blow up. And then, you know, it doesn't. So then, you know, your head didn't blow up, but you, you know, got a little sensation out of it. And so when a person first starts down drug alley, they do it to feel great because it takes them up. And then before long, what was a weekly habit or whatever, now it's every day. They don't do it to feel great. They do it to feel normal. They just, they just do it just so they can go to the store. I knew a guy, he had to have a bottle in his car because he didn't think, he says, the car doesn't, the car doesn't drive right if I don't have a bottle in the car. They don't show that on the beer commercials. They don't tell you that on, on the, you know, it's smooth going down and they use Sam, Sam Elliott. It's great to be an alcoholic because you could sound like this. And I'm 12, by the way. Uh, I mean, I remember because my dad was a drinker and he poured that smack down, down the drain and it sizzled. <laughs> it's like, what? I mean, that's why you hear these rockers and they just have velvet voices. Now they talk like this. It's not the screaming. It's the, that's that, you know, but my whole point is it starts out, you want to feel great. And now you want to feel normal. And now it's, it's, it's so deeply ingrained. Even if a person wants to turn to, oh, I, I, I can't, I can't go to church because I'm, I'm into this. I can't. Now, I want to make the point, yes, you can, if you're watching on YouTube or wherever. Yes, you can. But that's a lie from the devil. That's a lie from your own psychology. That's a lie from your own body. Because you've, the person has just sold themselves into sin so much, they don't know where they end and the sin begins. So they think that is who they are. God says that's not who you are. But that's, that's the lie. And he says they turn up and down all over the place, but they won't turn to me. He says, and they don't know the Lord. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. And therefore, Israel and Ephraim, they stumble in their iniquity. And Judah also stumbles with them. He says, they're so proud. They're so arrogant. Their own pride testifies against them. They won't repent. They won't admit that they're wrong. They won't turn around. And their own arrogance testifies against them. And the thing about being stupid is it, it spreads like, uh, like the flu. Because it says, therefore, Israel and Ephraim, they stumble in their iniquity. And he says, and also... Judah stumbles with them. Now, remember, at this point, Judah was doing good. Judah had a good king. Hezekiah was ruling down there. Judah went up and down. 
Israel, the whole time, ever since they split from, from Judah, they were just flatlined. They were dead the whole time. They had the greatest prophets ever, but their kings were horrible. Huh, it's kind of like California. We had some good preachers in California. Why? God said, your kings are horrible. You need some good preachers. I'm just saying. Um, but Texas has got some good preachers too. So, I, so there, there goes my little experiment. But the whole point is uh, Judah was going to eventually stumble along with them. It says, verse 6, with their flocks and their herds, they, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. For he has withdrawn himself from them. They were going to, quote unquote, sacrifice to the Lord to make their offering. But they didn't know the Lord. There was no relationship. It's, it's like people, you know, they come here, they don't know the Lord, they don't want to know the Lord, but they, they hey, where can I put an offering? You know, Jay was, I love talking with Jay. Jay's cool. Jay's my friend. Okay, Jay's my other friend. So that, that, that one time, that, yeah, the other guy's nine times. So the one time out of 10, talking about Jay. So my friend was talking about the old days of Calvary and this, one of the, one of the, the pioneers of Calvary, Tom Stipe, he would, when he was doing a Saturday night, he said, hey, first of all, if you're a guest here at the church, don't give nothing. Let the offering go by. If you don't know Jesus, you don't need to give anything. Only thing God wants is your heart. That was implied. But man, what a heart. I mean, that's God's heart because everybody's like, well, I'm, I'm good with God because I slipped the five in the plate or, or this and that and all that, all that stuff. And God's like, mm -mm, I don't want your little money. I want your heart. I want your, I want your service. All the people, oh, a lot of people, unfortunately, they think they're going to be square with the Lord when they get up there because, well, they helped out. I used to help with the food closet. I gave some money to this building project. I, I gave a homeless person a ride one time, and all those works are going to turn out to be filthy rags. The Lord says, I didn't, I didn't ask for any of that. I didn't want any of that. All I wanted was a relationship. And these guys were doing stuff and bringing stuff. And the Lord says, nah, what I wanted you to bring was your heart. And he says, he says, I backed away. They have dealt treacherously with the Lord, for they have begotten pagan children. And now a new moon shall devour them and their heritage. They dealt treacherously with the Lord because by bringing all these, these sheep and flocks and all this livestock, they thought they had the Lord buffalo. Oh, we're good, Lord, because look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm bringing. See, they had their buddies buffaloed and fooled, but they didn't have the Lord fooled. But they were trying to get over on the Lord. And he says, you, you've dealt treacherously with me because you're putting on this outward show, but in your heart, you, you know we're not cool. I, you, we need to get right, you and me. All this, this show that you're doing for other people, knock that off. You and me, we, we need to get it right. That's the treachery. And he says they've begotten pagan children. I hate to break it to people, but pagan adults give birth to pagan children. Uh, I mean, you don't know the Lord. And so those little kids are up there, they're watching you. Oh, my goodness, they're watching. I had to, I had to quit watching the news when Carice was first starting to talk because, you know, we had a president there, a president who was just the smartest president in the world. I mean, he was the smartest thing since sliced bread. I don't know how smart sliced bread is. But he'd sit there and he'd lie to me about my insurance and how I could keep my doctor. And, and he was, man, he was great. He was great. I mean, he was, he was changing it because every time I got my doctor bill, it was higher every time he talked. And so every time he talked, I would say, shut up. And Carice, I mean, this is a billion years ago. Carice was in the high chair, and I remember she said, shut up. And I was like, oh, great. Now, I could have just learned to control my mouth. I was like, nah, I'll turn off the TV. Because this dude was, he was provoking me to wrath, righteous wrath. I'm so, But the whole point is, is that they watch, and they listen, and they repeat. And a lot of people think, you know, I'm going to live one way, but my kid, you know, I'm going to be a gangster, but my kid's going to grow up to be a, a pastor. Now, sometimes it works out that way. But a lot of times, the kids double down. So these people, they were living in sin. These people weren't devoted to the Lord. They didn't love the Lord. And guess what? Their kids, they followed suit. And he says, and the new moon shall devour them and their heritage. They were so steeped in superstition that they thought if they went out and worshiped under the new moon, it would bless their crops. And the Lord says, I don't dig your superstitions. He says, you went out and you did that one time and I felt like being nice and I blessed your crops. And you think 
the new moon was the one that made him grow. You, you forgot me. And he says, your new moon, now when you go out and you do that under the new moon, I'm going to wipe everything out. So you quit doing it. Quit getting uh, wrapped up in, into superstition. And so he says, blow the ram's horn in Gebeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud in Beth Avon. Look behind you, O Benjamin. Gebeah and Ramah were, were watch cities. They were right by Jerusalem. And basically, Hosea was saying, when the Assyrians come, you guys better have your lips puckered and your throats clear because when they come marching, blow the trumpet. He says, they, the judgment is coming. So you guys, you better get ready. And it's funny because a lot of times people think, you know, I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. I'm going to keep on working this hustle and I'm never going to have to answer for it. The bill is never going to come due. And that's the way Israel felt. And Hosea came along and says, the bill is on its way. You can either try to pay it or you can get right and let me pay it. Play it. And, but they, you know, a lot of people are smart. He says, cry aloud at Beth Avon. Once again, that's another dig because Beth Avon, if you go and you try to look for <sighs> Beth Avon on, on a map, you won't find it. Or it may be in parentheses. It's Beth El. Beth El, Beth means house. El, God, is where uh, Jacob met the Lord for, for the first time and he called it Beth El, house of God. But by this time, it had become house of vanities. Which should have been a place where people could go and meet God. It was now a joke. It was now, instead of it being a steak, it was cotton candy. It was empty. It was just a show. And so he's doing a lot, a, a lot of digging. I, you know, the more you read the Bible, more, the more I realize I could have hung with these guys. Because I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but I'm a little snarky. I've got a bit of a sarcastic edge to me. You probably didn't pick up on that. I'm doing it right now. But anyway, uh, my kids used to say, Dad, are you being facetious? I'm talking. So, of course I am. Um, so he says that about Beth. Hey, cry aloud at Beth Avon. Should be, should be the house of God, but it's the house of vanities. Then he goes on. And he says, look behind you, O Benjamin. Now, that, that first came out uh, in the book of Judges with Deborah. And basically, that was a call to arm. It was a rally call when... when uh, when Barak was getting the troops. It's kind of like after 9-11, everybody was going around saying, let's roll or, you know, let's, you know, whatever, God bless America, whatever little rallying cry that you would say. And they were saying that. He, so he throws it out there. Hey, let's go. Let's roll. And he's like, you're not rolling anywhere but to Assyria. Because all of that had become a joke because they had left the Lord. It's kind of like, well, when you hear all these politicians get up there and they get the little flag lapels there and we're going to kill the babies and we're going to elevate the, the perverts and we're going to incarcerate the old people and we're going to break this law and we're going to break that law and everybody's cheering. And, like, and then they say, and God bless you guys and God bless America. And it's like, whoa, like, like Jay was talking about the, the, the people swearing to God all the time. And it's like, stop. It's like, how about, ask, how about asking America to bless God for a minute before we say God bless America? And it's, it's not even a prayer. I mean, God bless America is a prayer. I mean, hopefully we do it every night when we hit, hit the, the head to the pillow and we would just watch the news of God, would you bless America? I mean, and this is, I'm going to let you a little in on my business. Lord, I get it. We do not deserve your blessing. I get it. And I'm, you know, I am I'm by default, by association, by birth. I'm one of the offenders. God, we deserve more of the same. We deserve the, the fires and the earthquakes and the invasion. And I mean, we've asked for this as a nation. I mean, individually, we probably haven't. But as a nation, we have been begging for this as we've, you know, the kids can't get expelled from school. But God sure got kicked out. The cops can't get fired. Uh, my, my buddy, the other buddy, my one of two buddies. He's a cop and he, you know, you got good ones and you got bad ones. So the, there was a new chief who took over in his department and, the, and you know, the morale is horrible so nobody wants to work and they're just, they just go and hide. And the, when you come on new to a job, you're like, we're going to fix this. So the chief looked around and he's like, what do you got to do to get fired around here? They can fire everybody else. I mean, they fired God, but you can't, you can't fire anybody else. And see, when we say, Lord, would you please bless America? Lord, 
We don't deserve it. I mean, we, we deserve more of the same times 10. But Lord, I'm asking for your grace. I'm asking that you alleviate our oppression. I'm asking that you open the eyes of people, that you save people, that you turn things around. We don't deserve it. And just, you know, all the people, I'll claim it, I'll receive it. It's like, shut up. How about, Lord, help me, please? Because I told you to beat it, and I told you to shut up and quit talking to me. And now, because I'm broke, now I want to reach out to you. And it's like, how about some humility? How about some contrition? How about some reality? Lord, don't deserve it. I deserve a whooping, but Lord, I'm asking you for your grace. And anything else, anything else is, is let's roll and God bless America and look behind you, old Benjamin. Anything other than help us, God, please, because your grace is, is it's empty words. It's, well, it's Beth Avon. It's a house of vanity. He says, Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I make known what is sure. When they start to reap it, I will make, I will make it plain as day what's sure. In other words, as things get worse, I'm going to make it so very clear what's coming. The judgment that's on its way. The princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark. That was something that the Lord, he jotted that down in Deuteronomy. And I'm not going to take you there. But he says, don't do that. He says, I forbid that. I find that to be detestable. And what people would do is they, you know, they had landmarks like we do, and it was usually a rock or, or something movable. And what people would do is they, you know, if your neighbor wanted to increase his land and decrease yours, he'd take that rock and he'd move it a couple of feet. And he'd move it a couple of feet. You know, I'm glad we don't do that anymore. <gasps> we do. It's called eminent domain. If you got something the government wants, they just say, hey, we need this for a freeway, and they take it. And you know, some ladies that went to our old church, they had land in their family, the ranch. And every year, the taxes went up and the volume of the land went down. Every time the assessors came out, their land shrunk because they were stealing it from them. And it's, it's not a new thing, but that's when it talks about removing a landmark, it's talking about stealing someone's land. And that's, that's what their princes were doing. He says, I will pour out my wrath on them like water. So what does that mean, Jeremy? I'm thinking God says, I don't like that. Quit ripping off your brothers, what he's saying. But that was, that was just another day at the office. It's just one of the many indictments that the Lord was bringing against these people. And they were getting away with it. And they thought it was all good. But what does God say? Hey, I'll pour out my wrath of them like water. He says, Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment. We're oppressed. I mean, don't, don't get it twisted. Get out the, the, the bank book or pull it up on your computer and look through your, I mean, seriously, look at your bills and look at where it's going. And you, a lot of that you're like, oh, wow, they just felt like, you know, I love it when I get these notices from a entity that shall remain nameless because I don't want them coming after me. But, hey, just thought we let you know, your bill's going to be double next week. Thank you. Well, you really didn't ask, so you're not welcome. But stuff like that, and don't think people are like, oh, you know, you're stretching it. Don't think that there's not a correlation. We disrespect, dishonor, dismiss God, and yet God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him come in. I'm going to let him rip you off. Because cause you won't listen to me. There's a reason why, you know, later on, many books over, the Lord says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He says that in Malachi. Because he, 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 the Lord gave one of them messages that no one liked. And he says, hey, you know what? You're neglecting my house. You don't give the tithes. You don't give the offering. And he says, that's why you broke. I'm not, this is not a give your tithe offering, but I'm just saying how it connects. And the Lord says, hey, you get it right. You start honoring my house. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Basically, the image that he paints is, you know, you, you get 10 cents on the dollar. That's what your take-home pay is. You put it in your pocket and your pockets have holes in it. And he says, that's the devourer. You cannot get ahead. He says, but you get it right. Not, not so much with, the, with your checkbook, but with the heart. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. It's 
connect, but he, this oppression. He says, Israel or Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment. This is all stuff, their oppression was an, an oppression and a judgment that they had invited upon themselves. And that's where we are as a nation. Everybody wants to talk about man-made climate change. I used to work with the kids. I'm getting older, so the kids are getting older. 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds. Man, Jeremy, it's cold in this warehouse in December at 4 o'clock in the morning. Must be climate change. I was like, or, as us old dummies call it, weather. I was like, you know, I, I wish I had the power to make it hotter by watching TV in the middle of the night or turning on my, I mean, I wish I had power to impact the whole world that way, but I don't. I'm just following the science. But the oppression that we have, uh, especially in the state, no one talks about man-made oppression. No one talks about man-made judgment. Boy, the public schools are just horrible. That's man-made. Oh, this town, we don't, we don't gas up our car there. We just drive right on by. That's man-made. You know what? They are right about one thing, one, one little geographical thing that happens that they don't mention. There is one that is man-made. And there's all them stinking fires we have up here because they won't let us cut down dead trees. I'm just saying. And I was mad about that when I was living in the city because my mom was a historian and she would tell me, they haven't cut down a dead tree in California in 20 years, and they want to wonder why these fires are happening. And my whole point about fires and bills and craziness, a lot of times the oppression, the judgment, it didn't, it didn't get shipped in. We brought it in. And that's the way they were. That's the way, that's the way it's always been. He says, because he willingly walked by human precept, Human precept or human logic or man's wisdom or humanism is over here. And God's wisdom in, is over here. You cannot walk, walk both at the same time. You have to choose one and forsake the other. And they said, you know what? We're pretty smart, Lord. We've been on this earth about 32 or 48 or 75 years. I think we got it covered. I mean, you've been here forever, but I, I think we finally cracked code. So we don't need to listen to you anymore. And so they chose their own way, ignored God's way, and everything fell apart. That's the way that's what's going on in our country is just the status quo. It's not new. It's new to us. And I'm not saying, oh, well, that's just the way it is. Roll over and go to bed. That's the way it's always been. But a lot of times, you know what happens? God interrupts human events because a faithful few, a faithful group, say, Lord, would you please help us? Lord, we're heading down the road. The bridge is out, but we're too hard-headed. Lord, will you, will you push us off of this road to destruction that we're on? That's what happens when the Lord brings a revival. And it doesn't just change the, uh, the, the, the complexion of a church, but it changes the community. That's what happens. That's how you, okay, I'm just kind of going off because it gets me going. But anyway, so he says, verse 12, Therefore I will be to Ephraim like a moth. And to the house of Judah like rottenness. I'm just going to, you're going to rot, but it's not going to happen like that. I'm just going to gnaw at you. I'm just going to flutter. I'm just gonna, it's going to go down. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very gradual. I remember 9-11, well, the anniversary, the uh, commemoration was last week, and I remember th the, the original 9-11, we were at a conference and just met that guy for the first time. And uh, the next morning, the planes hit. And so, you know, we had the poobah with us then. So Chuck was there and everybody was like, what's, what's Chuck going to say? What's Chuck going to say? And Chuck got up there and he read, I believe, from Daniel 9, where Daniel basically confesses on behalf of the nation, even though Daniel had, Daniel was a good guy. It's the same prayer that we could say because, you know, we love the Lord, but we're part of a, a rebellious, hard-headed nation. And Chuck says, you know, a lot of times, you know, people sin, and they're waiting for their car to blow up the very next minute. Or they're waiting to be stricken as soon as they take the Lord's name in vain. He says, it doesn't happen that way. 
It's a gradual degradation. It's, it's a gradual decay. And he says, th- he says, this started way back in the 60s when we started kicking God out of stuff. And now, now all those seeds are starting to poke their, their heads up through the pavement. People thought, oh, it's, it's good. We, we're smart. We got money. But it starts to pop up. It was a slow rot. And then he goes on and he says, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim sent to, uh, to Assyria. And they sent to King Jerob. That's a, a title. If you look for Jerob in history, you won't find him. It's, it means the warrior king. It is referring to the king Tiglath-Pileser. And you will see his name in Scripture. You'll see it in Isaiah and I believe also in Ezekiel. Um, and But see, they were going to the enemy for help because they wouldn't go to the Lord. It doesn't make any kind of sense. He says, when, when Ephraim saw that he was sick and Judah saw that they were hurting, he says, they didn't turn to me. They went to the people that were going to eventually conquer them. And, he, you know, the Lord says, you know, times are going tough, but Judah's going to Egypt for help. And he says, you know, you're going to lean on him and it's going to be like a bull rush that that not only breaks but it's going to shatter and the splinters are going to go all in your hand and the whole thing is you know we still do that oh man we we got this problem so you know i, I guess i just need to get my my credit limit raised or you know i i guess i need to uh figure out some con or, or i'm going to max out my credit card and then pay that bill but then i'm going to get a new credit card and then and i'm going to do all this shuffling but I'm not going to go to the Lord and say, Lord, maybe I've been kind of stupid with my money. Maybe I've been kind of idiotic with my life. Lord, maybe there's some changes that you want to bring to fix the problem instead of doing this, this, little, this little shell game. And that's, once again, all the little cons and, and things that we do to alleviate the problem or to fix it, they're not new. And the Lord says, save yourself a trip. I'm going to tell you right now, none of those cons are going to work. Just come to me. But I will tell you, this is probably what's going to happen. That's why a lot of people don't want to go to the Lord. The Lord's probably going to tell you something you don't want to hear. The Lord's going to probably tell you to do something you don't want to do. He's probably going to tell you to quit doing something you really want to do. But if you listen to him, more than likely, eventually, the problem will be solved, like fixed, not swept under the rug, fixed. But, you know, it's a choice. He says, yet he cannot cure you, nor heal you of your wound, for I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them away and no one will rescue, uh, no, you know, uh, with the mountain lions to kind of get that up here. If you see one, either shoot it or run. I mean, don't shoot it because that's bad, right? So um, shoo it away and say bad mountain lion. You never know who's watching these things. So I gotta, gotta make sure I don't get the wildlife people after me too. But he says, hey, I'll be like a lion and I'll grab you and snatch, take you off to my den. And who's gonna, who's gonna get you out of, out of my jaws? And do you get the progression because a couple of verses before the Lord says, I'll be, like, I'll be like a moth, and the rot will be slow, and it'll be gradual, and you may not even notice it. But if you don't listen to that, if that's not enough to kind of wake you up the slow leak, he says, I'll be a lion. And then I'll, I'll roar, and I'll just start tearing stuff up, having a chat with uh, the girls, and just talking about the Lord, how, he, you know, I, he, he leads you to, to do stuff, to, to move, to do new things. He just, he'll, he'll put a desire in your heart. Go here, go there, do this. And, you know, she was saying, well, what if you don't want to do it? I said, well, um, the Lord, he, he whispers. And then the Lord speaks. Then the Lord clears his voice. And then he starts yelling. I prefer to move when the Lord is still whispering. I don't, I mean, 
he starts speaking. I'm like, Lord, your, your tone sounds kind of curt. Are we okay? And the Lord says, well, you're not listening to me. So the volume has to go up and the tone has to get a little bit harsher. Okay, well, that's great, Lord, but I still don't listen. And the Lord says, okay, now I got to start yelling because you're, you're a blockhead and you won't listen. So now I got to start yelling. It, we can listen to the flutter of a moth's wings. We can listen to the, the whisper of the Holy Spirit or the Lord can start shaking stuff up. The moral of the story is, listen, when the Lord says it, do it. Be obedient. I mean, that's the, that's the whole point of why we're here. And, it's, you know, it's just, but, you know, sometimes, I mean, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, I get it. Sometimes you hear the Lord and this, this just that little hitch in the get along called, but I don't want to do that but I'm kind of scared. to. I mean, I know it's the Lord. I know that eventually when I get to point B, it'll be great, but eh, point A is pretty nice. I don't, I don't want to go to point B. And the Lord's like, okay, <clears throat> I'm about to get the halls out of the, out of the hall closet. I'm about to clear my throat. Hey, get up and do this to quit being a hard-headed idiot. What'd you say, Lord? I can't hear you. Okay. Is this thing on? <laughs> and then here out comes the megaphone and the Lord starts yelling because, and then he starts, he starts turning stuff upside down and he starts to get your attention. And at that point you're like, boy, can we go back to the whispering Lord? He says, you get to moving and I'll get back to the whispering, but listen, listen, obey, move on it. And let's move on it and finish the chapter. I, um, yeah. We're not going to get into chapter six, uh, spoiler alert. You knew that before we ever left verse one. He says, I will take them away and no one can rescue. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. And then they will seek my face. And in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Okay, this is great because we're going to leave off on this and we're going to pick up on it next week. And there's, I was at a, I had a conundrum because this, this verse 15 is just fat with prophecy, but I think with practical application. And I'm going to do the practical application and we're going to look at the prophecy next week. How's that for a cliffhanger, right? The Lord says, you've sinned. You've hurt me. You've put me off. You've neglected me. I've called you to repentance. I've called you return, to return. I've called you to call upon me, and you've blown me off. You've shunned me. You've shined me on. So he says, you know what? That's okay. I'm going to return to my place until you acknowledge your offense. And then you'll seek my face. face. And in your reflection, you'll seek me earnestly. When we invite people to get saved, and I, I say it this way because it helps me to remember and it covers it. I say, hey, have you taken care of the ABCs? What do you mean, Jeremy? Well, did you admit that you're a sinner in need of a Savior? Yes. All right. Now, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he's God in the flesh and he died on the cross to wash away your sins? Yes. Well, have you confessed him with your heart and believed in, confessed him with your mouth and believed in your heart? Yes, then you're good to go. But a lot of people say, well, why do, why do I have to admit I'm a sinner? Why do I have to admit that there's a problem? Well, it's like the whole substance abuse. You can't move forward until you admit you're a drunk or a drug addict or you have a problem. You can't move forward. And once you admit, man, Lord, I'm a sinner, so I do need you. That's not an arguing point ever again. I have just admitted it to you and to myself. I have a Offended you. I deserve hell. I'm not a good person. I can't, I can't earn my wings, as it's been called. I'm admitting my offense that I have slighted you. And, and Lord, I'm, I confess it, and I ask for your forgiveness and your salvation. That, that, that salvation versus, oh, you know, I like going to church, and I'm a pretty good guy, and, you know, the Lord will let me in because he's seen all the stuff I've done for him. That's why so many people, they're churchers, they're, they're churchy-type people, but they're not saved because they've not, they have not admitted that they're sinners. And if you're not a sinner, do you need a savior? And if you don't need a savior, why are you going to cry out to them? And that whole thing of, hey, they got to acknowledge their offense. It's kind of, it's a big, it's a big thing, even amongst Christians, because no one likes being hurt. And everybody says, well, Jeremy, I got a problem with forgiving. I say, well, join the club. So do I. 
But I remember reading this blog years ago, and this pastor was saying, we are required to forgive people that wrong us. And basically that means someone punches you in the face. That means you are not waiting behind every corner in the world to get them back. You're letting it go. You're not, you're not, you're not seeking retribution or revenge. You're letting it go. But a lot of abusers say, well, you got to forgive, so stick out that jaw so I can have another swing at you. And I've told people, nope. Because the first one is forgiveness. I can do that all by myself. I can forgive a person who has been a jerk, who's currently being a jerk, who's going to die a jerk. I can forgive that. But restoration requires both. He's got to quit being a jerk. And then I have to trust him to let him back in my life. Restoration is a two-way street. So if a person's like, you know what? I, I, I said the magic words. I read your book, Christian. I'm sorry. You have to forgive me. And they talk like that, by the way. That's how they say it. And, and then you have to. Oh, yeah, I have to forgive you. That's why you're not spitting teeth right now. Well, you got to let me in your house. No, I don't. Well, we got to hang out. No, we don't. Because that's restoration. That's, that's reconciliation. And that, you have to change. Your actions have to change. And that's what it's talking about here. The Lord says, you acknowledge your offense, and then we can come together. You acknowledge your offense. You ask forgiveness. You've acknowledged it. You're willing to change. Now, the forgiveness has turned into reconciliation. That's what Paul talks about in Romans. The whole world is forgiven, but the world is not reconciled because they haven't reached out to the Lord. I mean, the check is right there. You can be forgiven or you can be, you can have the debt paid, but a lot of people say, I don't want it. I'm good enough. And here the Lord says, I will wait on you. I will wait for you to admit your part. And when you do, then we can. And it's tough because that's the way the Lord does with us. And you know what? A lot of times that's just the way it is with our relationships with, with people. People who have hurt us. Hey man, you, you got me real good back there. And you're my brother. You know, you love the Lord and I love the Lord. I ain't too hot about you, but I gotta let it go. So I'm I'm not seeking any kind of retribution. I'm not seeking you to pay me back or do this great penance. But until you admit you, you did me wrong, until you acknowledge it, there's going to be this wall here. I mean, we, I can, you know, there's a lot of people where I, hey, how you doing, Jeremy? Great. And that's pretty much all they're going to get out of me. I'm not going to cuss them. I'm not going to swing at them. But I'm sure not going to tell them my business. I'm sure not going to invite them. I'm sure not going to open up my heart to them because I don't trust them. That wall is still there. They're still going around pretending that everything is great. And until someone says, you know what? I did you wrong, and I am truly sorry. At that point, I can let the shields down. And the Lord says the same thing. I love you. I forgive you. You got you to own it, though. You got to accept it. And until you acknowledge your offense, I, I love you. I died for you. But the shields are still up. You hold the code. They'll come down when you're ready for them to come down. Well, I hope it, I hope I untangled the knots instead of giving you new knots. If I, have, if I gave you new knots, Jay's right there. Manny's in the back. They're great at explaining my foibles. And, uh, and, and there you go. Um, so yeah, next week we're going to look at that. We're going to start there. Remind me because I'll be like, all right, chapter 14. Uh, no, we're going to start on this, this last verse and we're going to look at it prophetically and then, then... We're going to do the rest of chapter 6, or start chapter 6. I'm going to blame it on the Lord. The Lord just wanted us to tap dance on that. I just talked too much. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that you forgive us and the door is open, but Lord, you do require us, well, to fess up. You require us to admit some stuff. Not even a whole bunch of stuff, but just admit we're sinners and that we messed up. And Lord, 
even in our interpersonal relationships, Lord, that we would not outgrow that whole thing of, I was wrong, please forgive me. And uh, Lord, just a wee bit off topic, Lord, but for those of us in this room that we're kind of there, we love friends, we love family members, but we got to do it from a distance because, well, things have not been acknowledged. And Lord, for those of us who still bear the hurts, Lord, that we would forgive. Lord, that you would heal the hurts. And Lord, help us just to continue to be the light, even if it's from a distance. But Lord, uh, we just continue to pray for healed relationships where and if necessary, Lord. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless y'all. Have a, a groovy week. That's from the Greek. See you real soon.